Several people asked me over the last 24 hours about the entire program because I keep referring to the program which is about 8 to 10 hours long. And I'm only going to get through so much of the program in the three hours they allotted me today. Particularly if Lana keeps doing the devotions and they go overtime. Oh no, I didn't... I, I, I don't know why I said that. I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, I'm joking. The five-year plan is a bigger subject than three hours. Would you you'd all agree that, right? And so there's nothing wrong with the fact that we can't cover it at a school. There's nothing wrong. It's going to take a long time to study and, and so on. In fact, it needs such thorough study that I think it's good that we don't finish it at this school so that we don't think that we went away and we know it all. So the program that I've developed and, and the notes I'm speaking from are going to take about eight to ten hours and I will be giving these talks, the whole program, quite soon in various parts of the country. So any of you that would like to get all the rest of the talks, you're welcome to email me and I'll send you a link or something like that. And there's a couple of ways we can do it. First of all, how many of you have given your email already to the school committee? Okay, so any of you have done that, I'll get the email from the school committee or I'll have them send you an email when it's available. And only if you haven't given your email to the school committee, like you're not getting emails, then give it directly to me. Give me your email and say, I want this. And then, then everybody will, will let you know when it happens. Because this plan needs thorough, thorough study. And I told the committee, I said, if you don't give me more time, I'm going to change it to the three-year plan. Because <laughs> it's just not enough. And then I realized that, no, we just have to do it. You know, some things have to be done completely. I was thinking the other day that if I could just say the Tablet of Ahmad with half sincerity, maybe I could get 50 martyrs, you know. <laughs> but then I realized it probably doesn't work that way. You know, you probably need to do it with absolute sincerity. I remember I used to think that there was a book I first, when I became a Baha'i, was called The Four Valleys. You've seen that? I used to think that that was the Reader's Digest version of The Seven Valleys. And, <laughs> And then I realized, no, no, it's a completely different book. You can't abbreviate the Seven Valleys. There can't be a condensed version. And so it's the same with the five-year plan. So let's move on uh, to what we were talking about yesterday. And uh, you remember that we said that we're building a system. It's like a life system that we're building in this five-year plan. It's very complex. It's going to take a long time to discuss it. But we know it's alive and it's organic in its growth. And so I want to talk about a couple of interesting things that are related to organic growth that I didn't mention yesterday. The first thing I want to talk about is something that has thrilled scientists for more than half a century. Some interesting fact about organic life that we learned in the 1950s, early 1950s. And if you ever get a chance, if you haven't already, look at a photograph or a documentary that shows the first moments of human life. Have you ever seen that? The first moments. Just two cells, they come together, they unite, and they form what we call a zygote, which is you know, the, the beginning of human life. The thing is so small that it takes a really special, powerful microscope just to see it. And even though it's unbelievably tiny, with these special microscopes, you can see these two cells come together, and then they duplicate and become four cells. And then they duplicate and they become eight cells, and then they become 16, 32, 64. And this method of growth, it's absolutely phenomenal. Pretty soon there's trillions of cells. It's amazing, don't you think? Now, when you look at the tiny human embryo, that little zygote, look at it on a picture sometime. And as you look at it, think that in just nine months, it's going to be a fully functioning human baby with eyes and ears and mouth and heart and central nervous system and everything that's there. In just nine months, it's going to go from that microscopic speck into this. So organic growth is absolutely amazing. But what's more fascinating is if you look at a human zygote, the first two cells when they come together, and you compare it in a microscope to a single cell bacterium, you know, which is the most primitive form of life possible. If you look at the two side by side, you can't tell the difference. It's, you can't really tell the difference. They both look, all life pretty much looks the same at that point. And so you say, well, how could it be that this human zygote and this bacterium, I can't tell the difference. How does one know 
to grow into a baby and the other remains bacteria? How, how do they know? And they found out in the 1950s that the answer is, is that within each cell is encoded the blueprint of how to build that baby. It's right in that first little tiny microscopic cell. And as the cells duplicate, 2, 4, 8, 16, they give this blueprint to each new cell. Each one has it. So you may ask, how big is that blueprint that it has? Well, according to science, the blueprint in the one DNA molecule of a human is 20 billion bits of information. Now, if you convert that to letters, it's about 3 billion letters. If you put these letters into average words and put 300 words on a page and put 500 pages in a book, the amount of information in one human DNA molecule would be about 4,000 books. That's what it is. It's a big library. How many of you have read 4,000 books in your life? Okay, and yet that's how much information is in the human embryo. Okay, encoded in it right at conception, even though it looks just like, you know, a, a bacterium. You have about a hundred trillion cells in your body. Look at your body right now, count up the cells, you'll find, <laughs> you'll find there's a hundred, there's a hundred trillion of them. Okay, there are three times as many cells in your body as there are stars in our galaxy. And every one of those cells has this 4,000 book library. Isn't that amazing? That's just how life works. All the information is encoded in it right at the beginning, inside it, even though you can't see it. And every living thing is the same. Plants, animals, insects, humans, and so on. Now, in the Resvan message of 2010, the House of Justice describes the workings of the system that we are building. Okay, and they describe the whole system, the administrative system, and how it all works. And they finish with this remarkable statement. I really want you to think about this statement. They say, the workings of this cluster level system, born of exigencies, point to an important characteristic of Baha'i administration. Even as a living organism, it has coded within it the capacity to acquire higher and higher degrees of complexity in terms of structures and processes, relationships and activities as it evolves under the guidance of the House of Justice. I almost fell off my chair when I read that. They said even as a living organism it has encoded within it. They just make a direct parallel to the way life grows through the DNA molecule. At the very beginning everything is encoded. So higher and higher degrees of complexity are already there. It's already built within there. So, there are so many implications to this comparison. First of all, it would be very easy to underestimate the potential latent in our administration if we just look at its present state. If you look at it right now, it would be very easy to underestimate it. But it would also be very easy to underestimate a human embryo. If you looked at it in a microscope, you'd say, oh, that's a bacterium. And it would look like that. But we understand this. Now, Shoghi Effendi said our administration was embryonic. That was the word he often used. And so this is very important. The implication of this also is that it tells you how far our administration is going to evolve. How far it's going to evolve. When we think about how complex a fully grown human is in relation to an embryo, how marvelous it is and how wondrous it is, you know. Think the same is true for the administration as it grows. Did we ever really think that the administration was going to stay in the same way it is today for all time? When it's going to guide and humanity for, for next 500,000 years? Did we really think it was just going to stay the way it is, that this is it? No, its future evolution is unimaginably great. And the future is encoded in it. It's embedded in it right now, if you could just see it. And so I want you to think about this every time you look at our administration right now. Uh, this morning I was talking with J.B. Eccles. J.B., are you here? He's not here, but he has... Did you see his little baby? Did you see that little baby? Is J.B. out there? See if he's got a little baby. 
He's three months old. And I looked at Gabriel, cutest little baby, and I said, what a useless human being you are. <laughs> I said to that little boy, I said, you can't string a sentence together. You can't walk. You can't talk. You can't do a thing. What a useless human being you are, I said to Gabriel. And, you know, that's what a lot of us do to our administration today. We look at it today and we say, what a useless administration. But when we look at Gabriel, we don't. We say, what a cute little baby, and we tickle it. Okay, now let's not tickle the administration, but, <laughs> but we need to look at it the same way you look at that little Gabriel. You really do. Every time you look at a little baby, think that's what we're looking at at our administration, because that baby will grow. I remember uh, Peter Kahn, who just passed away, he often used to say that if you compare a human baby at the same age to a monkey, like say a three-month-old baby and a three-month-old monkey, he said the monkey's got it all over the baby, the human baby. He said that monkey can walk and talk, can, they can't talk, I mean it can look after itself, it can take care of itself, the baby is, is, is nowhere near there. He said if you look at a human baby and a monkey and compare them, he says that the monkey looks like it's got it, but we know that the potential in the baby is far greater. And so we also should never compare what we're doing in the five-year plan to anything else. Don't compare it. Comparisons are wrong. I remember the um, comedian, Henny Youngman. I don't know if you know him. And uh, someone came up to him once and said, Henny, how's your wife? And he said, compared to what? <laughs> and, and, and sometimes we compare things. You know, we compare things that are not appropriate. You know, we want... An, we want an apple to be an orange or an orange, and we say, oh, the orange is not crunchy enough, you know, or we say the apples, you know, or something like that. Don't compare this system to anything. Don't compare a baby to a monkey. We're building something that has a future as great as from that tiny embryo to the baby. Okay, and I find this exciting because actually if you read the message of the House of Justice 28 December, they say the process of the evolution of the administration is going to make great strides in the next five years. We may not even recognize, even in, in five years, this evolution. So that's another principle of organic growth. And I'm sorry to Gabriel that I said he was a useless baby. Uh, don't tell um, JV that I said that. <laughs> okay. But let's move on. There's another very important principle to organic life that's related to what we're doing right now. And that's that Organic growth, or organic life, is part of a mutual system of life and death. A lot of people don't think about this, but life, Abdu'l-Bahá said, is the integration of simple elements into complex organisms, and death is the decomposition of those elements. That's all it is, and Abdu'l-Bahá talks about this quite a lot, that life is composition, death is decomposition. But if there were no decomposition, there'd be no elements upon which life could be built. And so if you look at the world around you, you'll see that all life is surrounded by death. Living plants are built upon decomposed elements of dead plants. That's why we put compost on our gardens. We're feeding new life with old life. Think about soil. Think about that for a moment. We associate soil with growth and fertility. But what is soil? What's the difference between soil and sand? Sand is just broken up rocks. Soil contains all the dead animals and plants that ever lived on this planet. Okay, that's what soil is. Okay, and we need that to grow. We need soil to grow. There's an essential relationship between life and death. The world is an endless cycle of integration, disintegration, and back and forth. Now, Shoghi Effendi, he spoke of the downfall of society that we see today in terms of disintegration. He spoke of the agonies of a disintegrating civilization. He referred to the forces of disintegration which batter at the fabric of a travailing society. And in many other places he said this. And he explained that the downfall of society that we see now is part of a twofold process. He said the downfall of society is part of a twofold process. One is the process of disintegration and the other of integration the death of the old world and the birth of the new. He said the deterioration of the old world order is necessary for the new world civilization to grow. I'm going to read this. 
in the World Letter of Baha'u'llah, he says, might not this process of steady deterioration, which is insidiously invading so many departments of human activity and thought, be regarded as a necessary accompaniment to the rise of the almighty arm of Baha'u'llah. It's just like the nature of life. Disintegration and death are necessary to life. He says in another passage, same book, he says, integration and disintegration are two parallel processes. One, the rising fortunes of God's infant faith, and the other, the sinking fortunes of the institutions of a declining civilization. So we should never be dismayed by the downfall and decay of society that we see around us now. Never be dismayed. In fact, we should view it in a positive light. Not that we're happy that people are suffering, okay? We shouldn't be happy that people are suffering, but we should be happy to know that their suffering is going to be alleviated by this process of integration, which we are part of. The Guardian says this, oh, look at this, bring this baby forward. Bring that baby, come on, bring that baby here. I wanna, I wanna talk. I want to talk to this baby here. Oh my God. This is Katie and this is Gabriel. Come here, Gabriel. I'd like to introduce Gabriel here. And Gabriel, I, I just want to say, I want to tell you, Gabriel, that you are a useless human being. Okay, you can't walk, you can't talk, you can't do anything, right? Would you agree? Okay, I want you to take a good look at Gabriel, and every time you have anything negative to say about your administration, I want you to see Gabriel's face. You got that? I want you to see Gabriel's face before your eyes, because that's our administration. Thank you. Okay. She says that um, the administration needs a nap. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm glad she came in right at the right time. So we were talking about how disintegration is necessary for life. And Shogi Effendi says the disintegration of society is necessary for the growth of the faith. And he wrote this, this is a letter written on his behalf. He said, there are two things which will contribute greatly to bringing more people into the cause. So remember that, there's two things. What are those two things? He says, one is the maturity of the Baha'is within their communities, functioning according to Baha'i laws and in the proper spirit of unity. And the other is the disintegration of society and the suffering it will bring in its wake. When the old forms are seen to be hopelessly useless, the people will stir from their materialism and spiritual lethargy and embrace the faith. So when we look at people in the world and see their disillusionment and their alienation and their suffering, perhaps we should think of those people as the compost of the new society. I know this is not a very charitable way of, refer <laughs> of referring to people, but remember this that when atoms and molecules are attached to another plant, they are not available to the new plant. It's only after they disintegrate that they become available. So more and more atoms and molecules of mankind are becoming available. It's like atoms and molecules become lonely and alienated after death and they seek out life. That's exactly what happens. And they seek out something that's alive and growing and our system is alive and growing. And the sooner we build this system, the sooner will the disintegrating people of mankind have something to reattach themselves to and become alive again. And that's really what we're doing in the world. We're bringing life to humanity and we're bringing something they can become attached to. And you can feel this in people, that they crave to have some form of community life. So this is another principle. This system that we're building right now Okay, this system that we're building, we're building it in every cluster on the planet. Okay, right now there's several thousand of them. And it's going on, this growth, these little Gabriels are taking place in the islands of the Pacific, in the frozen plains of Siberia, 
in the you know, heart of Africa, even in Atlanta and Nashville. I mean, everywhere <laughs> in the world, this new life is stirring. Okay, this is what we're doing. And the House of Justice says in the next five years, the growth is going to be phenomenal. That is really the, one of the main exciting things about the 28 December method. The growth is going to be phenomenal. Now, when the House of Justice sets goals for us, we can view them like a prophecy. That's, I, I think any time they set a goal, you could view it as a prophecy. They wouldn't set a goal for us that wasn't possible to achieve. Of course, it takes effort, it takes energy, it takes systematic action. But we have every reason to expect that they will be achieved. And the goals of the five-year plan are staggering in relation to the growth they anticipate. For example, they say we need to increase the number of clusters that have intensive programs of growth to 5,000 in these five years. It took us 15 years to get to 1,600. And now, we want to more than triple that in just five years. Do the math and you'll find out that that's a seven-fold increase in our growth rate. It basically means that we have to have a new cluster of intensive program of growth, 720 every year, which is approximately two every day. So by tonight when we eat dinner, somewhere in the world, a new cluster will have to have emerged. And when we, eat, when we meet here tomorrow morning, another one and do that every single day until 2016. And that's what the House of Justice is calling for. Absolutely phenomenal. And they say it's not just the number of clusters entering this stage. They said even within clusters where we've reached that stage, they say we must increase and become larger and larger in size and all kinds of other things. So the growth is going to be tremendous and we will be astounded. In 2016, don't go to sleep for the next five years if you already slept <laughs> for the last 15 because you're going to be astounded by what happens. The most obvious principle of organic life that I haven't mentioned yet, one that I should have mentioned first, but I left it till the end, which I think is probably the most important principle of organic life that relates to the plant. And that is this, that all life eats every day. And in some cases, more than once. Okay, okay all life eats every day. <laughs> All life has to have food. It has to have nourishment. Now, the word of God, we're told, is food. We're told the word of God is spiritual food. Regular nourishment from the word of God is as essential to spiritual life as physical food is to physical life. We hardly let a day go by without eating. And so it must also be with the word of God. Otherwise, we'll die spiritually just as our physical bodies would starve without food. The Word of God has always been symbolized by food. In the Old Testament, it's called manna from heaven. Jesus referred to it as bread. Baha'u'llah and Adabaha frequently referred to it as food from heaven. And if you analyze all of the activities of the plant, every one of them, you could say that each one of them is nothing more than a delivery system for the Word of God. Just think about it. Think about every single one of them. They really are just a feeding system for the Word of God. For example, the House of Justice describes the Institute process and they say there's five main features of the Institute, the study circles. Do you know what those five are? Let's look at them. They say the first is the spirit of fellowship, okay, that it, that it creates. The second is its participatory approach. The third is its depth of understanding that it fosters and the fourth is the acts of service that it recommends. And you say, well, that's pretty good. Okay, that's like, I can't think of any more. And they say, but, number five, above all, they say, above all is its reliance on the Word of God. That is the primary feature of the dynamics of the Institute process. The same is true for children's classes. We're feeding the Word of God to the hungry hearts of the future adults of mankind. Same with junior youth. And of course, devotional gatherings, what do I have to say? They're nothing but a feast in which we all get to eat together spiritually. And there's, you know, how many of you like to eat food? One, two, three, four, yes, okay. <laughs> the only thing more enjoyable than eating food is eating food together with your friends and family, isn't that right? We love to eat together. And this is what we're doing in devotional gatherings. It's a communal eating of the Word of God, so to speak. Now, there are two things that distinguish the Word of God 
from anything else you can read. Okay? And these are one, that the Word of God is inexhaustible in meaning, and two, that the Word of God has creative power. These two things distinguish the Word of God from anything else that you can read. The fact that the Word of God is inexhaustible in meaning is a profound concept. And it's something that we really need to think about because it's so different to the way in which we approach anything else we read. If you, you know, read a magazine or an article or a book or something, you're not really inclined to read it again, isn't that right? Unless maybe you really like it or you have to study it, but even then you're only going to read it maybe a few times more. If somebody offers you a novel that you've already read, you say, no thanks, I've, I've already read that. You know, do you have anything I haven't read? This is how we treat things that we've read. Now, you wouldn't do this with food. If you ate fish once in your life and then you went to someone's house and they were serving fish, you'd say, no, I've eaten fish once in my life. <laughs> you know, you know, give me some food I haven't eaten. Okay, you wouldn't do that. So thinking of the word of God like food is, is very helpful. You have to agree. But thinking about the word of God as being inexhaustible in meaning, that's even more mysterious because it's so contrary, it's so counterintuitive to the way we think about things that we read. In the hidden words, Baha'u'llah says, myriads of mystic tongues find utterance in one speech and myriads of hidden mysteries are revealed in a single melody. In the Kitab i Igan, Baha'u'llah refers to a tradition that says that every verse in the Word of God has 70 meanings. But we're told that this is not a literal thing, it's not an exact number, it's just to signify that there are numerous hidden meanings in the Word of God. And in fact, the Bab in one passage, believe it or not, he says that the number of meanings in each letter of the Word of God is equal to the number of atoms of all things. So you count up the atoms of all things, and that's the number of meanings in the Word of God, the Bab says, which is a lot. You know, it's, it's infinite, right? Now, this has extraordinary implications for the way in which we carry out the methods of learning in the five-year plan. For example, in the institute process, in our study circles, the tutor, as well as the participants, should have a humble attitude of learning. We all know this. It's not like one person knows everything and then they impart their knowledge to the group. Everyone is learning together, including the tutor. But this humble attitude of learning, it would be hard to do unless it were genuine. And it has to be genuine, wouldn't you agree? It has to be genuine. In other words, if the, if the tutor was not genuine in this, you would sense it. And this would be difficult if we were just dealing with the writings of ordinary humans. But with the Word of God, it's no problem at all. Because with the Word of God being absolutely inexhaustible in meaning, the tutor never knows everything that's in there. Okay? If it were the writings of men, the tutor would, after a while, know everything that was in there. Because there's only so much meaning that they could get. But because the Word of God is inexhaustible, it's not a problem. Let's say, for example, that a tutor has been through the same program a hundred times. A hundred times they've been through the same program. And every one of those times they learn something new out of the same writings. Let's just say that that happened, okay? Now, they're in a study circle and they're with people that have never seen the program before. How many more meanings are still available to the tutor? So let's do the math. Okay, if the Word of God has as many meanings as the atoms in all of existence, then the meanings still available to tutor are the number of all the atoms in existence minus 100. That's how much is still left, okay? Which is still plenty more to go, you understand? So in this way, this is the key to true humility, that we're approaching the Word of God and it's absolutely inexhaustible in meaning. And when the tutor approaches the Word of God in this way, with this attitude, the participants absorb this attitude and they in turn become tutors and this whole culture is perpetuated. And in this way, the Word of God has the power to continually transform humanity and not just become frozen in meaning to the limited understanding of certain individuals. When an individual shares their understanding of the Word of God, when anybody shares their understanding of the Word of God, as a mullah does, or a Baha'i speaker, or anyone does, a priest, mullah, when they share their understanding of the Word of God, it can be wonderful and insightful, but it's still as nothing 
compared to the potency of the writings themselves. Not even the greatest speaker, not the greatest scholar, they can't enlighten us in the way that the Word of God can if we're exposed to it in its pure form. And purity is important. Physical food is better and more nourishing when it's pure. You agree? If the teacher reads the Word of God and then comes to his own understanding of it and then just tells you his understanding, that's like processed food. That's what it is. It's just processed food. They've taken the Word of God and they've extracted one part of it what they could get from it, one of the myriad meanings. And that's what they can grasp, and then they give it. But it's not the pure thing. We want the Whole Foods market, not the McDonald's of spirituality here. Okay, that's what we want. Do you understand? And now, for the first time in the history of religion, we're gonna get this. Because the Word of God will constantly have the power to transform us and never be limited by the understanding of mullahs or priests or rabbis or gurus. Do you understand? This is a profound transformation in the history of mankind that's taking place just from this one implication that the Word of God is inexhaustible in meaning and that we all approach learning with this humble attitude. And the transforming power of the Word of God, which is the other feature I was talking about, I don't think we have time to talk about it in the detail I'd like to. But it is also very, very important. The Word of God, when you're directly exposed to it, has a power to transform you. It's, it's almost like magic. I want to read something to you from the Kitabi Akdas in which Baha'u'llah talks about the effect the Word of God can have on people who recite it. And this is what he says. He says, they who recite the verses of the All-Merciful in the most melodious of tones will perceive in them that which the sovereignty of earth and heaven can never be compared. From them they will inhale the divine fragrance of my worlds, worlds which today none can discern save those who have been endowed with vision through this sublime, this beauteous revelation. Say, these verses draw hearts that are pure unto those spiritual worlds that can neither be expressed in words nor intimated by illusion. Blessed be those who hearken. So he's saying that the word of God is far more than the words. It's far more than meaning. Just by reciting them, it draws you to another world. And this is what it's all about. I want to finish this section on organic growth by telling you a story from the early history of the faith. And it's a story that I think kind of, it kind of illustrates many of the points we've been talking about. During the time of Abdu'l-Bahá in the Holy Land, it was the custom to rise around dawn and the family would gather in the master's room and they would say prayers and then they would have breakfast together. So Abdu'l-Bahá was the first organizer of devotional gatherings, okay? Um, and he had them every single day. They were in his room. How would you like to, you know, I'm just going to go and have prayers in Abdu'l-Bahá's room and eat breakfast. And this happened every single day in his time. And they say that even the smallest children would go. They would go to this. And they would sit very quietly with their arms crossed and their legs fold and, and they would very reverently participate. And there's some recollections of a doctor, Zia Baghdadi, who was there at the time and he wrote about this period. And he said that there was this one five-year-old boy who attended all of these sessions and he was a very small five-year-old boy. He said he was smaller than the average five-year-old. But he always was on time for every one of these prayer sessions every morning. And Dr. Baghdadi said that the only problem was that this little five-year-old boy kept pestering Abdu'l-Bahá to write something for him. <laughs> and that's exactly the words. He says he was pestering Abdu'l-Bahá. And so finally Abdu'l-Bahá wrote to the little boy. And I, I want to read to you what he wrote. And by the way, the name of the five-year-old boy was Shoghi Effendi. So <laughs> here, here's what, here's what Abdu'l-Bahá wrote to him. He said, he is God. O oh, my shogi, I have no time to talk. Leave me alone. <laughs> you said, right, I have written. What else is to be done? Now is not the time for you to read and write. It is the time for jumping about and chanting, O oh, my God. Therefore, memorize the prayers of the blessed beauty and chant them 
that I may hear them because there is no time for anything else. Now in the Priceless Pearl, it's recorded what this little Shoghi Effendi did when he got this message. I want to read that to you. It says, when this wonderful gift reached the child, he set himself to memorize a number of Baha'u'llah's prayers and would chant them so loudly that the entire neighborhood could hear his voice. <laughs> when his parents and other members of the master's family remonstrated with him, Shoghi Effendi replied, the master wrote to me to chant that he may hear me. I am doing my best. <laughs> and he kept on chanting at the top of his voice for many hours every day. Finally, his parents begged the master to stop him. <laughs> but he told them to let Shoghi Effendi alone. Now I mention this because it's not just a beautiful story, but it really illustrates what we're discussing because see, Adibaha knew exactly what this young five-year-old needed at that stage in his development. He knew exactly. He said, now is not the time for reading and writing. And God knows, we know Shoghi Effendi was exceptionally going to be talented at reading and writing. I would have said, you know, get the child going as soon as possible. Get him <laughs> reading and writing. The younger, the better. But Adivaha said, at this stage in your life, you have to focus on two things. Jumping about and chanting the word of God. And, and don't underestimate either of those two, by the way. Let's get this clear. Medical science has found a close correlation between motor development and cognitive development. In other words, a child needs physical activity for their brain to grow and develop. It's very, very important. In fact, studies have now shown that this correlation between physical activity and brain development extends far later into childhood than we first imagined. Adabha knew Shoghi Fendi needed a well-developed brain. He knew this. So he said, now's the time for you to be jumping about. Also, we know that Shoghi Fendi was to need all the physical strength and health and stamina for what he would need later in life. He wasn't to sit around at a desk all day, reading and writing. He'd get to that stage at some other point and he'd do very well at it. He didn't need to start at this stage. And the other thing the five-year-old had to do was to pray and chant, memorize the words of God. Spiritual education first. That's what Advaha wanted. Advaha said do only these two things because, quote, there is no time for anything else. And that's the way the growth and the development of the faith is. All of the plans that we've had from Abdu'l-Bahá, Shoghi Effendi, and now the house, all of them focus on what we need to do at a particular stage. And we need to focus our time on those things. Because when the head of the faith identifies something as a particular need at a particular stage, if we do that, that's the surest path to our growth. So, I think that's a nice story, and just remember that. How many of you uh, to train your children to memorize the Word of God? I don't think there's anything greater that you can do for the future of the world than that. And this is exactly what Adibaha did with Shoghi Effendi. Just think about that. I want to move on to now, I actually finished my talk yesterday just now. Okay. <laughs> so now I'm going to move on to the talk today. I'm sorry, things take longer than I think. Um, um, my talk today is called The Twofold Mission of the Five-Year Plan. And I get this title from a phrase that Shoghi Fendi used in Advent of Divine Justice. And in the Advent of Divine Justice, he was talking about the seven-year plan. It was like 70 years ago. And he said that the Baha'is had a double crusade. He also referred to it as a twofold crusade. The plan was twofold. And he said one of them was to regenerate our own inner life. And the other one was to address the problems of the world through the plan. So the plan actually was two plans, really. It was all the stuff we have to do, and we have to regenerate our inner life, and that's another plan. And in other writings, he said, you have to have your own plan to do this one. It's a twofold mission. Now, why am I talking about something Shoghi Effendi said 70 years ago, about this twofold mission? And that's because the House of Justice referred to it in the 28th December message, and they said we would do well to reflect on this, to ponder and reflect on the implications of what Shoghi Fendi said 70 years ago. So, let's do that. Let's reflect a bit on this. But before I reflect on it, I want to mention two really important principles about what we understand to be the nature of religion. 
So I think I'm going to talk about these first and then we'll get on to the, the twofold plan and, and what Shoghi Fendi said. Okay, what are these two things? The first is that Adabaha said that there are three kinds of religion. Do you know that? There's three kinds of religion, Adabaha said? And what are those three kinds? And when you think about this, when Adabaha says there's three kinds of religion, there can be three kinds of Christians, there can be three kinds of Jews, three kinds of Muslims, three kinds of Baha'is. The first kind of religion, he says, is the religion of your family or your race or your nation or your background in some way. In other words, you're a Muslim because you're from a Muslim background or a Muslim country or so on. You're a member of the religion because of your background. And we know many people that are followers of various religions because of this particular definition. Wouldn't you agree? Even some Baha'is might be that definition. Adda Baha says this is weak traditional faith. As he refers to that type of religion as weak traditional faith. The second kind of religion he says is one which comes from knowledge and understanding. One studies and learns and understands and comes to believe and accept the teachings of a particular religion. Adabaha says this is good, but there's something better. And that's the third kind of religion. He says the third kind of religion is the religion of practice. The religion where you actually carry out the teachings, not just accept them and believe in them. That's the third kind of religion. And he says this is real faith. So there's actually three categories of religion. Category one, category two, and three. They're kind of like hurricanes, okay? You know, you don't just say a hurricane is coming, but you have to say which category, because that makes a big difference. Now, Adi Baha says that you're not really a Baha'i unless you're a category three Baha'i. You're not really a Baha'i. In one quotation cited by Shoghi Fendi in this very passage that we're referring to in Advent, he says, Adabha says this, ye must conduct yourselves in such a manner that ye may stand out distinguished and brilliant as the sun amongst other souls. Should any one of you enter a city, he should become a center of attraction by reason of his sincerity, his faithfulness and love, his honesty and fidelity, his truthfulness and loving kindness towards all the peoples of the world so that the people in that city may cry out and say, this man is unquestionably a Baha'i for his manners, his behavior, his conduct, his morals, his nature and disposition reflect the attributes of the Baha'is. Not until ye attain this station can ye be said to have been faithful to the covenant and testament of God. So you may ask yourself, having read this, am I really a Baha'i? Or who, who, who is a Baha'i? And Adi Baha was asked this very question in London about a hundred years ago. And he said this, he said, it makes no difference whether you have ever heard of Baha'u'llah or not. The man who lives the life according to the teachings of Baha'u'llah is already a Baha'i. On the other hand, a man who may call himself a Baha'i for 50 years, and if he does not live the life, he is not a Baha'i. An ugly man may call himself handsome, but he deceives nobody. <laughs> I don't like either of those. <laughs> I don't like either of those examples there. But that's what al says. An ugly man may call himself handsome, but he deceives nobody. So, Let's think about this. What is a Baha'i? What does it matter what you believe? Okay, what does it matter what you believe? We have completely redefined religion. Adi Baha'i has completely redefined the definition of religion. Wouldn't you agree? He says that you don't think of a religion by what it believes or what it teaches. You think of a religion by what they do. People say, oh, tell me about Christianity or Islam. What do they believe? Who cares? What does it really matter what you believe? What does it matter what you call yourself? What does it matter what you label yourself? What ring you put on your finger, what badge you wear, or what your family background, or what question you answer in a census, or how many meetings you go to? What does it really matter? Or even activities you participate in. What does any of that really matter if you don't actually carry out and practice the teachings? This is what Adi Baha is saying. Transformation 
is the reason the manifestations of God came. They didn't come so we could label ourselves as his followers. That's not the reason he came. And this is not just true of ourselves, it's true of what we teach and how we teach the faith. For example, the House of Justice in their Rezvan message of 1989 said this. They said, it's not enough to proclaim the Baha'i message, essential as that is. It's not enough to expand the roles of Baha'i membership, vital as that is. Souls must be transformed, communities thereby consolidated, new models of life thus attained. Transformation is the essential purpose of the cause of Baha'u'llah. So we're not going out there to try and increase the number of people that label themselves Baha'is. We're trying to transform the world by people transforming. And unless we reach that, really nothing has happened. So that's one important principle, that to be a Baha'i, you need to be a Category 3 Baha'i. You all got that? Category 3 Baha'i. Number two, and this is another important principle, Shoghi Effendi referred to it, an Adi Baha. And this is the principle that light shines best in darkness. It's a very important principle, Adi Baha. I'm going to read you something Adi Baha said. When he came to America, he said this. Among the proofs of the existence of a divine power is this, that things are often known by their opposites. Were it not for darkness, light could not be sensed. Were it not for death, life could not be known. If ignorance did not exist, knowledge would not be a reality. It is necessary that each should exist in order that the other should have reality. Now, as we know, the Baha'i revelation began in the Sea of Shal. We know this. You cannot imagine a darker spot than that. You had to go down three narrow flights of stairs through the dirt into the bowels of the earth. And there at the bottom, Baha'u'llah said, not a single ray of sunlight ever penetrated that spot. You could not see your hand in front of your face. It was that dark. And yet in that pitch black darkness, Baha'u'llah brought light to the world. And I think it's no accident that the light giver of the world gave birth to this light in the darkest spot on earth. Furthermore, you could say that Baha'u'llah couldn't have been any more shackled. These chains were put around him that were a torture in themselves. They weighed a hundred pounds. You know that? A hundred pounds. Baha'u'llah, they said, was very small. I wonder if he weighed much more than a hundred pounds. And yet they put two of these on him. It took several men just to hoist them up and, and put them on a special device just to get them onto Baha'u'llah. And as soon as they put them on it, they cut right through the skin to his bones. And they aggravated the wounds every time any prisoner moved. You could not have shackled him any more than this. And yet, in these chains, Baha'u'llah brought freedom to the world. And he himself, with beautiful irony, he said this. He said, the ancient beauty consented to be bound in chains, that mankind may be released from its bondage, and accepted to be made a prisoner, that the whole world may attain unto true liberty. So in pitch black darkness, he brought light to the world, and bound with chains, he brought freedom to the world. And I want you to think about this. Today, we have our own Sia Shah. We have our own Sia Shah right here today. The darkness of the world around us, the immorality, the decadence, the corruption, these are spiritual darknesses into which we have been cast, just as Baha'u'llah was thrown into that Sia Shah. And you could also say the world is in chains. Wouldn't you agree? the chains of materialism, the chains of self, passion, desire. I believe we are called upon to shine our light in the darkness of the world in the same way that Baha'u'llah did in the Sia Shah. I believe this. And remember, light is not afraid of the darkness. In fact, light is helped by darkness. If you shine a flashlight outside in the daytime, you can hardly tell if it's on. But in dark night, and you turn it on, you can really see the flashlight. Wouldn't you agree? Even a tiny match in darkness can be seen. If you turn on a movie projector like this one and the lights are on, they say turn the lights off so we can clearly see the projector. Well, we're like that projector in the movie theater of life. That's what we're like. We're called upon to project the light of a good character. 
And Baha'u'llah said, the light of a good character surpasses the light of the sun. So some people say, oh, it's hard to be a Baha'i in this day and age when the world is so dark. Think about it this way. It's easy for a light to shine in darkness. It's easier. You got that? It's easier. Okay. So things are known by their opposites. And this is an important spiritual principle. And Shoghi Effendi often talked about this. You know, in, um, in India, the symbol of the manifestation of God is the lotus flower. Do you know why? Because the lotus flower is pure and clean and fragrant in the dirty cesspools. And yet it's never affected. It sits right in the dirt and yet it's pure and clean. And for this reason, it's the symbol of the manifestation of God. And Shoghi Effendi said something interesting. He said, why did Baha'u'llah come to Persia? He said, Baha'u'llah came to Persia because had there been any other spot on the earth that was more decadent and corrupt, Baha'u'llah would have gone there instead. He went there because Persia was the most decadent spot, the most degenerate spot on earth. And this is a principle. And you know, I know several Persian friends of mine. I understand this perfectly well. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have said that. I should not have said that. Look, look. Show. This, this, this is in the writings. This is in the writings. Okay. Okay. But let me tell you something. So the point is, is that light, light shines in the darkest spot. Light shines in the darkest spot. Now this is interesting because Shoghi Effendi referred to this principle when he talked about the American Baha'is. And when he was writing Advent of Divine Justice, Ria Kanum said that as, read in Price of Pearls, she said as he was writing it in 1938, she said never in her life did she ever disagree with Shoghi Effendi, except once. And that was when he was writing Advent of Divine Justice, and he was writing about this principle that Baha'u'llah came to Iran because it was the most decadent spot. And the reason the American Baha'is have been asked to build the administrative order, because they're the most corrupt politically. And he said, America is the most corrupt nation in the world. He said, and Riha Kanum, she said, no, Shoghi Effendi, surely there are other nations. Now this is 1938. Remember 1938, Mussolini is running Italy, Hitler is running Germany, uh, Mussolini is running, uh, Stalin's running Russia. Let's get this right. Ria Kanum, who was just a pioneer in Germany, she said, surely Shoghi Effendi, there's a few other places you can think about. Shoghi Effendi turned to her and said, no, America is the most corrupt, politically corrupt nation. Swallow it, it's good for you. <laughs> That's, and he said, and he wrote it, in, you can read it. He wrote it, he said, that's why the Americans have been given this job. Because it will show the transforming power of the Baha'u'llah. Okay, so the Persians, you can't be mad at me now. Okay, <laughs> you got this. Light shines in a dark world. Now, um, well, how much time do I have? I have only five minutes. So I'm just going to introduce... I'm just going to introduce this subject because now these are just the principles. So Shoghi Effendi, he writes in the Advent of Divine Justice that he said there are things that he says are spiritual prerequisites for the success of the plan. He said you got the whole plan over here, all the things you got to do. And then he said there's these other things that are prerequisites. In other words, a requisite is something that's required and pre means it's required first. And he said that these prerequisites are spiritual and he said, they said they're the bedrock upon which this plan would work. Okay, and he says that these three things are, first, a high sense of moral rectitude. High sense of moral rectitude. The second, he said, was absolute chastity and purity. And the third, he said, complete freedom of prejudice. Those three things. Now you say, oh, that's not so hard, three things. But the thing is, yeah, why didn't you say so? You know, just, you know, those three. But then he goes to describe them page after page with quotes from Baha'u'llah and definitions and suddenly you realize that these are not really three things as much as they're three categories. And uh, he defines them all quite well. I'm just going to tell you maybe some of the definitions and tomorrow we'll get into them a little more. Rectitude of conduct, he said, have seven elements. 
Seven elements to rectitude of conduct. When you say rectitude of conduct, you're saying seven things. And they are justice, equity, truthfulness, honesty, fair-mindedness, reliability, and trustworthiness. Those are the things. And he says, we have to have those things. He said, particularly the administrators, but everybody has to have those. Otherwise, the plans are foredoomed to failure. So we're going to have a whole session just on rectitude of conduct because we need to talk about this. And we're not just going to talk about defining it and believing in it because that's not what religion is. Religion is not accepting. How many of you agree that truthfulness is good? Okay. How many of you believe that fair-mindedness is good? So that's not the point. The point is how do we do it? That makes us a category three behind, not a category one. I can easily make you a category two behind, get you to believe in this stuff. That's not hard to do. So in the program that we're going to do later, we're going to try and see how we can take rectitude of conduct and make ourselves category three Baha'is, not just believers and acceptors of it, but actually practice of it. That's the first one. The second one, they say chaste and holy life. They say it has five implications and it has six things that it calls for. So there's really 11 things. So chaste and holy life, it has 11 definitions. Did you know that? Yeah. And it's good that he did that because sometimes we think the word chastity has a very narrow implication and we think it just means one thing. In fact, chaste and holy life, and the House of Justice also refers to it as purity, it has 11 definitions. Here's the five things that he say are its implications. Modesty, purity, temperance, decency, and clean-mindedness. Those are the five things. And of course, temperance is uh, not drinking alcohol. So he says, you know, you can't be immodest, you can't be impure, you can't be an alcoholic, you can't be indecent, you can't have a dirty mind. I mean, I'm, I've, this is modesty, purity, temperance, decency, and clean-mindedness. Those are the five things that are part of this one category. And then he says it calls for six things that you have to do. And then those six things are very long. I'm not going to read them now because I don't have time. Tomorrow we'll read the six. Anyone know what the six things are? Have them memorized? Well, we'll talk about them tomorrow. Then he comes to freedom from prejudice. And he says freedom from prejudice has four flavors. It comes in four flavors. You know, if you go to the ice cream store of prejudice, you'd say, what flavor do you want? You can have race. You can have creed, which is religion. You can have color uh, and class, okay? All of those are different forms of prejudice, and they're all of those. And Shoghi Fendi talks about them in great detail, but then he spends a lot of time on one particular flavor. He spends a lot of time, and that is racial prejudice in America. He spends page after page about it, and he defines not just the problem, but the solution. For example, he lists how you can solve this, how you can become a category three and not a one. He says there are certain things that, he says, I think there's four things that white people must do. There's three things that black people must do. There's four things that they both must not do. There's one thing that they both must do. Do you know all this? Yes. We're going to look at that tomorrow. The point is, is that we have to become category three, free from prejudice. Okay. I remember some time ago, there was this Baha'i, it wasn't a Baha'i, but it was a program on raising awareness for racial issues. It was many years ago, 10 or 15 years ago, and some Baha'i friends of mine were going to it every week. And after, you know, maybe eight weeks, he said to me, he said, you know, I really like this program of raising awareness. It's changed my life. He says, changed my life. And I said, I, I believed him, and I was excited. I said, oh, really? So, you know, what has it done to change your life? And he said, oh, it's just changed my life. I said, well... Uh, since you've done the course, how many times have you uh, gone over to the house of a black person and spent time with them? This is nothing. How many times have you socialized or they come to your house? Have you gone fishing? Have you gone to movies? Uh, what, what exactly when you say it changed your life? And he thought about it. He said, you know, you're right. It hasn't done anything to my life. <laughs> so basically it made him a category two. He believed, but he didn't practice. Okay, and this is quite a big deal. And the House of Justice says, that this issue of race is not finished. I want to, I'll, I'll finish with that. They say this, you know, sometimes we think, oh, is the race issue solved or is it not solved? The House of Justice in this message of 28 December, 
Let's get this clear. They say, while it is true that at the level of public discourse, great strides have been taken in refuting the falsehoods that give rise to prejudice in whatever form, it still permeates the structures of society and is systematically impressed on the individual consciousness. And this is today, this is, you know, this is today. It's still going on. I uh, recently heard a story, St. Peter was at the Pearly Gates and there was a huge crowd lining up and they couldn't get in. And St. Peter had to announce, he said, I'm sorry people, but we have a backlog and we can't process everybody quickly. We're only taking heroes at the moment. And in the very back, a black man raised his hand. He said, well, then take me. I'm a hero. And St. Peter said, oh, really? Well, what did you do? And he says, well, I married a beautiful white woman. In fact, she was from one of the wealthiest white families in all of Georgia. And we got married right in public on the steps of the county courthouse in Macon County, Georgia. And St. Peter said, really? When was that? And he said, oh, about five minutes ago. <laughs> So, the fact that you're laughing, it says something, doesn't it? It's still impressed in our consciousness. Until I can tell that and we don't laugh, we're not there. We need to become category three in freedom from prejudice and in all the others. So tomorrow, let's get into this category three business. And uh, so thank you all very much. I look forward to talking to you tomorrow.